At over 4 million acres, Katmai National Park and Preserve is a vast and wondrous landscape, full of tundra, volcanic and glacial features, sedge meadows, spruce forests, and more. It also contains roughly 500 miles of coastline, and today we are talking about one of Katmai's most enigmatic creatures, the wolves of coastal Katmai. Welcome everyone to today's live chat on explore.org bear camps. I am Ranger Leon and today I am pleased to introduce Ellen Dimmitt. She was a guest researcher at Katmai last year and working on her PhD in wildlife science. So thanks for joining us, Ellen. I'm happy to be here. And always great to have you. Um, and just so viewers know, don't forget that we are also going to take live questions at the end of this chat. So drop them in the comments and we hope to answer as many of those as possible towards the end of our program. And again, welcome back, Ellen. Last year, we did a similar live chat around this time as well, talking about your research. And that's the link to last year's live chat. Um, but for those who need a refresher and also for those who are joining us for the first time, um, perhaps we can start from the beginning before getting into some of the more recent results and discoveries. So to start us off, Ellen, can you tell us a general overview of the research that you've been doing? Yeah, so in all of my projects, I'm using non-invasive genetic methods to study wildlife, especially wildlife that is more rare or elusive. And I've spent most of my time during the PhD so far working in coastal Alaska. Um, last summer in Katmai, we did four months of field work out on the Katmai coast, uh, collecting coastal wolf scats and hair samples. This project sort of started originally because people and rangers were seeing wolves with sea otters pretty often on the coast. Um, I mean, carrying a dead sea otter. And we sort of thought, what's up with that? And wanted to investigate more specifically the diet of these coastal wolves. We use a method called fecal DNA metabarcoding to identify prey species that a wolf has eaten from the DNA that's left over in their poop. And we can also sequence the DNA from the wolf in its own poop and use a method called SNP genotyping to identify and distinguish individual wolves. So that's so, an overview. Just a, of the, that's a pretty sorry. good overview. <laughs> and. Um, you know, mostly with wolves here, we are talking about, we're trying to learn about wolves in general, but also their ecology, right? Is that kind of your focus essentially, uh, food ecology? Yeah, so foraging ecology specifically, that's just a study of what uh, the animals are eating in an area. And uh, for these coastal wolves, we're especially curious about what marine resources they might be taking advantage of. Okay. And then um, to be clear, because last year you were here in Katmai, but this year you weren't actually here in person. Um, you were someplace else, just north of us, less than 150 miles away. So Ellen, where were you this summer? Yeah, so this summer was Coastal Wolf Research Part 2, this time in Lake Clark National Park. So I actually spent four months on the Lake Clark coast and visited five field sites and did something very similar, which was just collecting wolf poop, collecting wolf hair from snares, going to den sites and rendezvous sites and looking for other genetic materials from them. And yeah, just generally studying the foraging ecology of the wolves in that different system. Nice. And um, so Lake Clark, different kind of experience than here at Katmai. But even though you weren't present here at Katmai this year, research did continue um, at Katmai um, using our park ranger biologists on the ground here, correct? Yes, Kelsey and Ellie were actually able to collect wolf scats from a site that we hadn't previously sampled uh, at Kaguyak, which is really exciting because this site is actually situated between two sites we have already gotten samples from. So it will be cool to see whether the wolves that we're detecting there are the same wolves or whether it might be a different social group uh, in between there. And also we had some new puppies at a couple of the sites that we were able to get some pictures of and we were able to get scats from some of those as well. And we also had an NPS marine biologist from the regional office doing some offshore work, some boat based marine biology work. And they were actually able to collect us some samples of wolf and bear scats from islands off of the Katmai coast that we're going to get to analyze as well. Nice. It's 
always impressive to think about how large Katmai is because I know we tend to focus so much on Brooks Camp and that's just such a small area. And you and our biologists have been fortunate to see more of this park than I think many people will ever be able to. So it's, it's really interesting to hear about the coast in general, for sure. Um, but, you know, we're yeah. talking about wolves and why? Why are wolves important for us to learn about, the coastal wolves in particular? Yeah, so coastal wolves are pretty unique because the suite of resources that are available for them to exploit while living on the coast are very different than that for wolves living further inland. In Alaska especially, most wolf populations will survive by acquiring large hooved mammals, which we call ungulates, like moose or caribou or black-tailed deer, and then filling in the gaps between those big carcass meals with smaller animals like beavers or rabbits or squirrels. So this means that the wolves living in the interior regions of Alaska and the lower 48 tend to move throughout a pretty large territory in search of those prey animals or following migratory caribou herds, for example. Whereas wolves on the coast are able to exploit seasonal salmon runs and can also hunt or scavenge marine mammals like seals and otters on the beach. So there isn't as much incentive for them to leave the coast as long as they can keep finding food. So our project in Katmai, like I mentioned, started because people were observing wolves with otters on the coast, and that's a pretty unique observation. Nice. And um, so you're talking about what they eat, and you mentioned briefly how you were collecting this data. You're doing a lot of scat. Um, we also, you know, in the past, you've used some hair snares to do different things, and you use cameras. Um, and you mentioned that these are all non-invasive techniques. So we're not collaring or anything like that. Can you expand a little bit more just on, on non-invasive in general and why that's important for us? Sorry, I missed the end of your question there because my internet is not so great. Could you repeat it, please? <laughs> Yeah. So um, we were just talking about how, you know, you use non-invasive methods essentially to um, collect all of your data. And so we're not collaring our wolves and we're not darting them or anything like that. And you, can you talk just in general why it's important for us or even especially for your project too, um, and we can do the work without using these invasive methods? Yeah. So I think the most important aspect for me, at least, about the non-invasive work is that it allows park visitors to have a relationship and interactions with wolves that might not be possible in a system where wolves are being shot and captured for um, research. So the wolves on the Katmai Coast, as you know, maybe some of the viewers have experienced who've been lucky enough to see them, are not super afraid of people and they'll come right out in the open in front of visitors, uh, which is really cool. And if we were, you know, getting these wolves into a sort of wariness state where they're having to watch out for helicopters or they've kind of learned that humans might mean an unpleasant interaction, then those sort of inter like visitor experiences wouldn't be possible. The other consideration is that uh, to dart a wolf from a helicopter to put a collar on it is really complex. And it's especially complex if you have to land the helicopter on a beach or in a sedge meadow. Um, and get to the wolf while it's tranquilized in time. And it's especially complex when you're working in a wet system as well, because you don't want to tranquilize a wolf and have it fall into water and potentially drown. So we get around all of that by just using genetic methods and it's worked really well. We were able to get over a thousand scats and analyze them. And it's so far the data looks pretty great. So I think that it really worked out well with this strategy this time. Nice. That, that is great to hear. Um, and I know last year you were trying something new. Uh, you were trying to get DNA from tracks. And if we could potentially get an update on how successful this was or what we learned from it. Yeah, I know there are people out there for sure who are really interested in getting updated on the, the wolf tracks from Katmai. Unfortunately, the DNA that we were able to get out of those was not very good. Um, I think the main problem was that for each sample, we only collected sand from a couple of footprints uh, and that doesn't add up to enough DNA um, for us to actually be able to work with it. But it's not necessarily a dead end because through a conference where I was talking about this method, I was able to make a connection with some researchers in Minnesota who were able to get wolf DNA out of tracks in the snow. And they had actually collected 30 paw prints per sample. So they had a lot better quality DNA in their track samples. 
And they had tried to genotype them, which was identify the individual wolves in them uh, using a different sort of molecular marker called microsatellites. And it didn't work out for them that way, but they actually sent me those samples. And now I'm going to get to try my method of genotyping or not my, a different method of genotyping, SNP genotyping to see whether that might be more successful for this highly degraded, highly fragmented DNA. Nice. So super interesting. You know, it didn't work for specifically the purpose that you were hoping to, but it opened new doors for sure. So <laughs> mm -hmm. it is great to be making those connections. Um, but kind of back to the results that we're finding, you know, you've had time to do a lot more uh, analyzing of the scat. And so what are they eating? What are we finding? So I mean, I sort of spoiled it already with all of that otter talk, but it was extremely cool to see that otters are indeed the most common prey item we're seeing in cat mycostal wolf scats. So, so far, as many as 30% of the scats that we've analyzed from wolves have had otter DNA in them, which is pretty astounding. And just to be clear, that doesn't mean that that many otters were eaten necessarily, but rather that that many meals came from otters on the Katmai coast because it's on the per poop basis that we're thinking about these things. So beyond otters, uh, we also see a lot of salmon in coastal wolf diet in the summer, which is cool because that's something that we've seen in other systems as well. But the extent to which they're eating salmon was even higher uh, on the coast than we were predicting it to be. We saw that salmon DNA is showing up in about one out of four Katmai coastal wolf scats. And again, this is just for the window that we have sampled, which is just a couple of months in the summertime. So obviously salmon aren't going to be available year round for these wolves, but we definitely know now that at all of our field sites, the wolves are taking advantage of the salmon run and catching those salmon and eating them for a lot of their meals. Um, we saw that wolves are still eating moose on the coast, uh, but not nearly at the sort of level that we would expect for wolves in general. Um, moose aren't at showing up in as many as scats as you know, fish or sea otters are. And uh, also something worth mentioning is that a dead moose is a lot of meat and can potentially feed several wolves for a while. Uh, so even one dead moose could contribute to wolf DNA or moose DNA in as many as 20 wolf scats. So just because we see you know, moose showing up doesn't necessarily mean they're killing a lot of moose. It means that they got a lot, yeah, they got a lot of meals from a moose at some point. Um, and then something that's almost frustrating but interesting behaviorally that we've been seeing in our results is that red fox DNA keeps showing up in our samples when it doesn't really make sense as a diet item. For example, we might have a wolf scat that we see a lot of sea otter DNA in and maybe some fish DNA as well. And then we'll see a lot of reads or sequences of red fox DNA in that scat as well. And it's frustrating because we can't tell from that information whether the fox was actually eaten or whether fox DNA ended up in the scat by some other means. For example, foxes really like to pee on top of wolf scats. It's a dog thing. They mark over one another. So we keep getting contamination from this behavior from the foxes. Yeah, I can see there's probably so many difficult things, even just like working in remote places. And then that's something that I hadn't even thought about is that kind of contamination. So right. <laughs> difficult work. <laughs> yeah, it's um, fun, though. It's then, like a puzzle. Yeah, I, I love it. <laughs> I love hearing about it, too, because it's really interesting to hear like just the day to day of what you're actually doing, because all of the science, yes, it's great to hear and understand that. But um, I was also fortunate to go out with you last summer in Katmai and just to see the everyday process too is really insightful in general. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, from everything that you are learning, perhaps can you tell us what is surprising to you? Yeah, so like I said a bit earlier, the sea otter was sort of expected, but the amount of sea otter that they're getting is pretty astounding um, when you think about what they actually have to do to be able to kill them. So we think that, you know, sea otters are at carrying capacity on the Katmai coast, which means their population is sort of at the max level that it can be in a stable way. And that means that otters will die more often from things like disease or malnutrition. So this contributes to more otter carcasses washing up on the beach that wolves and bears are able to get to. 
Um, but there has to be some hunting happening as well. And if any of you were on the uh, viewed the talk from last year, you you remember that we actually were fortunate enough to witness a wolf killing an otter or a group of wolves killing an otter. So we know that they're actually hunting them as well. But for them to be hunting and scavenging enough otters that it is the number one prey item and showing up in one third of the wolf scats that we've analyzed is pretty incredible to think about. It means that these wolves across all of our field sites, all six of our field sites, so potentially different social groups of wolves have figured out strategies for acquiring marine mammals as their primary prey item. It's super interesting. And, and you brought up something there um, that I just like to touch on because you said that you've seen them like in groups because I always think of wolves hunting in packs. And is that kind of similar on the coast? Are they pack hunting? Are they individual hunting? Or what kind of methods are they using? I think that there's some variability because I think that while it's maybe easier for a group of wolves to take down a marine mammal, it isn't necessary um, for all of them to be involved all the time. Uh, I'll share two anecdotes that'll sort of get at this. When we saw the wolves kill the otter last year, there were three wolves. And the way that we think they were able to get the otter was by doing a sort of pincer maneuver and separating the otter from its exit to the water. So two wolves went around each side and got in between where the otter was hauled out on the rock and where the water was so that the otter had no escape. And that sort of maneuver would be hard for a wolf to do by itself. It would have to be very fast or very sneaky, which they are most of the time, but still easier if you have pack mates. On the other hand, Kelsey, the coastal biologist here, um, witnessed a single wolf kill a single seal, an adult harbor seal that probably outweighed the wolf. And the wolf was able to do this by itself by being persistent, basically. It grabbed the seal's tail and it pulled it away from the water. So again, separating them from their escape. And then it bit the otter, or the seal repeatedly until it died, basically. But it took like 20 minutes and it was a big fight. And uh, yeah, definitely would have been easier if there were several wolves involved. So uh, I guess to answer your question, they, both strategies happen. Um, I think it depends on, you know, how many pack members are available for the hunt at that time. It might be that some have to stay back to take care of the pups, or it might be that some are in other places uh, of their territory doing something different at the time. Interesting. And like, I love hearing your stories and anecdotes from the field. And um, I know you were in Lake Clark, but I'm still interested to hear what kind of stories you have from this season, even if it was in a different location than Katmai. Yeah. So, I know people love the wolves, but I'd like to share a non-wolf story. We were doing this super epic journey between two of our field sites. It was about 25 miles of hiking with all of our gear and we were collecting, and that's as the crow flies 25. I don't know with the coastline how much it actually was, but um, we were collecting cameras that we had set earlier in the summer. And we got to a site where I had set a trail camera on what appeared to be an active den. It was small, it wasn't a um, uh, wolf den, but you know, either an otter set or a fox den. And I was reviewing the videos on the camera and I noticed that we had several videos of foxes that had moved in and had had puppies and they had four puppies that were playing right in front of the camera. And we got all of those videos and it was wonderful. And as I'm looking through them, as time passes, you know, in the little camera image that I'm flipping through, um, I noticed there were fewer and fewer pups. And then by the end, there were only two surviving or at least only two still showing up in the photo. So I kind of remarked to my field technician, like, oh, like only two pups made it from this group, which is like pretty normal. You know, it's hard out there for the foxes and every animal. Um, but then put the camera in my bag, walked maybe 100 meters further down the beach. And lo and behold, there is the female fox with one pup and they were sitting on the beach as if they were waiting for us and very unafraid, let us pass right by. But it was definitely the mom and baby, one of the babies that I had just seen on the camera. So that felt really special and serendipitous and cool. Yeah. Just like, um, you know, we have the bear cams at Bricks Camp, you have your field cameras and just, and you get to see so much as well as see so much in person. So <laughs> 
Right. We got so lucky with our cameras this year too. We also had set some on just a bear trail that was going to a body of water at one of the sites on the Lake Clark coast. And there was a whole family of otters, river otters that were going back and forth on that trail pretty much every day. And then they had pups. So then we had a bunch of videos of otter pups as well playing right in front of our camera. So it was just like a very lucky baby year for us. Nice. Um, and so, you know, what does the future of this project hold? I mean, you've done Katmai, you've done Lake Clark, um, and I know you're still processing all of that data. So can you tell us more about what the future looks like? Yeah. So now that we've gotten most of our metabarcoding, which is our diet data results back for the wolf samples, um, we're moving on to, or we already have moved on to this stage of genotyping, which is a little bit of a different method. We're using single base pair differences in the DNA of individuals to distinguish them. It's called a SNP panel, and SNP, SNP, stands for single nucleotide polymorphism, which is just those single base pair differences. So we've, another one of my lab mates has developed this assay that we can use for wolves to tell them apart from these SNPs, and we're deploying that on our cat mice samples so that we can count exactly how many wolves we have represented on the coast. This will allow us to see how many individuals are living in each pack. It will give us confirmation of how many packs there are for sure. It will tell us how many puppies the wolves that reproduced had in the year that we were out there. And it will allow us to give a, for the first time, a minimum population estimate for wolves on the Katmai coast. So that's kind of what's in the works right now, we've actually just started to get back the first rounds of our data from that. So in the next couple of weeks, I'll really get to start digging into that more and I'm looking forward to it a lot. Uh, and then on the sea otter side of things, this you know amazing utilization of sea otters in Katmai has really gotten us thinking about the mechanisms uh, of you know wolf sea otter population interactions and how many sea otters wolves are eating is still a really big question. So one way we were thinking of trying to get at that, and we don't know as a disclaimer, we don't know whether this is gonna work yet, it might not be possible, but the idea is that we could use the same sort of method we're using to identify individual wolves, that genotyping method, and instead apply it to the sea otter DNA that's in the wolf scats. And this, if it works, would allow us to count and, and distinguish individual sea otters within wolf scats for one pack for one season. So say the Hallow Bay wolves are eating sea otters. We could ask in our sampling period, how many sea otters did the Hallow Bay wolves eat? And this might allow us to get closer to kind of disentangling this relationship between the wolves and the otters and answering some questions about how many otters does a wolf pack need to kill to feed itself for a summer. So many things to learn and so much that we have learned already. Um, but I think uh, we have nearly 30 viewer questions. So um, I think we're going to try and get it to quite a few of those if we can. Um, otherwise, we'll hopefully answer some in the comments. But if we could, uh, yeah, let's get into some audience questions. Great. And to start us off, you know, um, if you could, you talked a little bit about population, um, but could you tell us a little bit about the population of wolves in Katmai in general? And then I know Brooks isn't necessarily your specialty, but anything you can illuminate in that. Yeah. So like I said, we're still kind of in real time getting these genotyping data back. Um, but that does include samples that were collected by me and by other park staff at the Brooks area and along the Valley Road. So we will, with these data that we already have collected, be able to count how many wolves we have represented in our samples from the park's interior. I would say that based on my limited knowledge and experience with the interior Katmai wolves, I think the Brooks Camp wolves is probably one social group, so one pack. Um, that might be fairly large. Uh, I think that it would be really interesting to spend more time looking into the sort of images we have of those fishing wolves at Brooks to see if we can maybe visually distinguish any individuals to get a min minimum count. But because I've been so focused on the coastal wolves, I haven't really gotten into any of those questions yet. Um, I think my, my prediction is that the Katmai Coast has at least six wolf packs, which is pretty incredible. Uh, but I can't confirm that until 
we're done with this genotyping analysis. Yeah, and when you when you say incredible, is it because of how many there are in a small space, or can you define define why <laughs> why it's incredible? Yeah, too? it's it's first of all because of how many there are in a small space and how small their territories would have to be. We know wolves are extremely territorial in most instances and don't really tend to overlap the social groups. So for there to be so many in a small area would be astounding, and also for them. For there to be so many sustaining themselves without access to large ungulate prey besides you know moose which aren't super abundant on the coast anyway is amazing because we think of wolves so much in you know predator management discourse and even just in common everyday conversations about them we think of them as being like deer killers inherently we think of them as needing large ungulate populations in order to be stable and survive um, and Katmai, as a case study, would sort of disprove that theory because these wolves are using sea otters instead. Interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what else we've got from viewers here. All right. And so, you know, Katmai, most people know us because of our bears. So can you tell us how do the bears and wolves get along? The bears and wolves are neighbors. Uh, yeah, this video is a bear wolf interaction that we saw last year, where you can see it's interesting. There's no no super obvious adversarial relationship between them. But the bear is kind of bullying the wolf in this video. And I think it goes both ways. There are anecdotes from uh, a paper that was published in 2006 on wolf bear interactions on the Katmai coast that um, talks about wolves stealing salmon that bears have just caught. So like the bears got the salmon in its paws and the wolves sneak up and they take the salmon from the bear. And there's also anecdotes of bears kicking wolves off of carcasses. So I think it kind of goes both ways, but because resources seem to be so abundant, they're very tolerant of one another and you don't really see the sort of like fights that people might imagine between two predators sharing space. Yeah, and I think, you know, I've heard anecdotes from that whale carcass that washed up in Hallow of like many bears and wolves feeding at the same time. So it's all about, you know, food, food availability and abundance too, like you're saying. Totally. Yeah. And we saw that in, in Kamashak last year, a humpback whale died and washed up. It was like the best thing that happened all summer. It was so exciting because there were 13 boars feeding on the carcass at once. And then a wolf came up and I have never seen a wolf act so submissive. It was so funny. It snuck up between all the bears and it grabbed its bite of the whale and it ran off with it and it ate it far away. So they, yeah, like I said, tolerant of one another, but you do have to tread lightly when you've got such a big potential competitor. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> And yeah, so, you know, we see bears high grade, essentially. So, you know, at times they're only eating portions of the fish, but um, do wolves, do they eat the whole fish or just part of it? This is a great question. I think that both happen as with the bears, sometimes a bear will eat a whole salmon too, but we do see pretty often that wolves will eat just the head. And ideas about this are that the head is the most nutritionally dense part of the salmon. So it makes sense if salmon are super abundant to just eat the head. Um, but also, it could be a mechanism of parasite avoidance if eating just the head and avoiding the gut content of the fish um, might prevent exposure to parasites. So I uh, can't really say anything more specific because I am not super well versed in parasites. But I think it's interesting. They do definitely eat just the head when salmon are super abundant. I wouldn't have, yeah, I guess it makes sense. I just would not have uh, thought about that without being questioned first. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and then how are the wolves learning? Are they learning their fishing and hunting techniques primarily from, from their moms? Yeah, so this is also a really cool question. And there are other graduate students I know and other researchers who are dedicating their entire research journey to answering questions of how that sort of knowledge is transferred in wildlife populations. Uh, we have this question also specifically in the context of otters, like how are wolves figuring out how to get otters? Because otters historically have been on the Katmai coast, but they were extirpated 
um, by the fur trade and then reintroduced in Southeast Alaska and then spread across the Gulf of Alaska and now are sort of actively recolonizing the Cook Inlet, which is why we see otters on the Katmai coast, but we don't see them yet off of the coast of Lake Clark. They will be there eventually. But anyway, I think that wolves are transferring this knowledge of how to hunt otters to their pups, definitely. I think it's something that is taught. And the reason, uh, one of the reasons I think this is that we have images of very young wolves um, with otters from Swick Shack. One of the images that were shown in this presentation was actually a year old wolf probably with an otter. And also we see when wolves are patrolling the beach for hunting, they will bring their year old pups um, with them. So if, you know, as soon as pups are like hunting, traveling age, they're coming with and they're watching their parents get the otters, that's going to be a direct transfer of like, this is how we hunt. This is what our prey are here, etc. Nice. Very interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. And then I know you, you've mentioned a lot of different things that they have access to on the coast, but how does their diet vary compared to more inland wolves? Yeah. So coastal wolves we see utilizing a much larger breadth of diet items in a lot of instances. Now, this isn't true. There are definitely interior wolf populations that eat a big variety of prey, but comparatively, um, these wolves are getting not just salmon, but you know, eating halibut that wash up dead. They're catching starry flounder. They're catching sand lance and rock gunnel. Um, they're eating marine invertebrate prey. They're picking blue mussels off of the rocks. They're digging clams. They're eating even sea cucumbers. Uh, have, they've been seen eating sea cucumbers in Southeast Alaska. They're killing all sorts of duck species we keep seeing. They're, they kill seagulls. They scavenge eagle carcasses. They kill um, lots of small rodent prey. So they're getting Arctic ground squirrels. They're getting voles, shrews, squirrels. Um, and this is, you know, largely because they don't have as much of a large bodied prey option, like, you know, a big elk or something to fill all of their meals. So they have to sort of do a lot of in between foraging to fill in those gaps between the large meals that they're able to get. Um, and that leads to a lot more of a generalist foraging strategy, which means they eat a lot of things. They're not super specialized on one diet item like elk. They're able to eat a lot of things and be very flexible in their diet. Interesting. And then I guess similarly in talking about what they're eating, right? You've talked about a lot of different sources, but what you haven't mentioned is any kind of vegetation. So if times are tough, will um, they eat vegetation to survive? Yeah, this is an interesting question too, because there are definitely a lot of berry eating wolves out there, especially in um, some of the work coming out of northern Minnesota has shown that for the weeks that blueberries are maxing out up there, the wolves eat a lot of them and will actually bring their pups to the blueberry patches to eat the blueberries. So that's something that's been seen in other systems and that we've also seen on the Katmai coast. We do have wolf scats that were full of low bush cran cranberries. So that's something that they're taking advantage of. I don't think that they're eating enough of it to really say that it's like a super major diet item for them, at least not that we've seen. Um, but it's definitely something that they're taking advantage of. Uh, and the other thing, it's kind of funny, we oftentimes will accidentally pick up a wolf scat thinking it's a bear scat or vice versa, because a lot of the times wolves, just like, you know, your dog, your domestic dog might, will eat grass when their stomach is upset or to help them digest things. So you'll get these scats that are just almost entirely grass, but it's shaped like a dog poop and then it has bones in it too sometimes. So they're definitely eating grass. It's not the same sedge that the bears are grazing on. Um, and it might not be a nutrition thing. It might be something that they're doing to help their digestion. Uh, but yeah, wolves definitely do eat veg and they eat insects too. Oh, interesting. Yeah, they seem quite yeah. opportunists in general, so. <laughs> they really are. <laughs> um, and in terms of the kinds of wolves, right? Um, are the wolves in the Katmai coast, are they gray wolves or are they a subspecies? Yeah, so all wolves in Alaska are gray wolves. There has been some discussion of creating a separate designation for 
coastal wolves in general. And I know that the Ar Alexander Archipelago wolves in Southeast Alaska have been designated as a subspecies for the purpose of listing them under the ESA as threatened. So that um, is usually a designation like, you know, when you separate a species into some species, a lot of the time it's because there is a conservation benefit um, to being able to protect, protect a specific subpopulation of that species. So cat my coastal wolves, as of right now, they're gray wolves. I'm interested in doing some more uh, fine scale genetic work, kinship analysis with, you know, the cat my coastal versus interior wolf populations. Um, but as of right now, I'd say that for all relevant purposes, they are great wolves. It's good to know. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then, you know, we do this field work during the summer. Um, obviously, it's really tough to do it other times here because of Katmai's remoteness and the uh, harshness of the environment. But what are we missing from the wolves diets by not collecting scat and hair samples in the winter? Yeah, I really wish it were easier to access coastal Alaska in the wintertime because I think it would be extraordinarily cool to have a year-round diet study of these wolves because otters actually reproduce year-round. They don't have a discrete breeding season. So theoretically, they should be able to take advantage of that prey option year-round. And the Katmai, the cook inlet, doesn't really freeze solid. So there isn't going to be any sort of ice uh, facilitating or inhibiting the ability of wolves to get out to these haul out islands and other offshore features. Um, I think that what we might be missing would be utilization of the salmon um, in the winter time. Like that would be kind of a big difference that we would expect, obviously, because salmon aren't available. Um, but the question of do coastal wolves stay on the coast throughout the winter time and keep eating, you know, mammals that wash up dead or killing sea otters and seals that haul out. Uh, I think that would be a really cool question to answer and is a really important thing to know. Um, just as of right now, we don't have the means to get out there and answer it. Yeah, still lots to learn. <laughs> Perhaps one yeah, day. Yeah, <laughs> always. <laughs> yeah. I need to learn how to fly a helicopter. <laughs> well, in Alaska, lots of people know how to fly, so I wouldn't put it out of your range. <laughs> okay. That's true. <laughs> um, and then another question, uh, how will this research benefit the wolf population in terms of human education about their needs? Yeah, good question. So I think that understanding wolf diet and, you know, publicly spreading discoveries about wolf diet is really important because a lot of wolf hatred is predicated off of this idea that they're killing machines and that they're going to go for your livestock and that they're going to go for, you know, all the deer you want to hunt or whatever. And it's definitely true that wolves do kill those things they need to eat just like anything else that's alive. But I think that, or I hope that demonstrating the sort of flexibility of their diet and um, the fact that they're not, you know, these sort of mindless uh, killing machines, but rather they're creatures just trying to survive out there by eating what they can find um, might help some people uh, better understand wolves as a animal that's struggling to survive out there in the same way that everything is and uh, worthy of respect and appreciation. And I think we have time for one last question. Um, let's see. And how do you feel about the overall general health of Katmai's wolves? We make jokes that Katmai is wolf heaven because the wolves on the coast that we see seem to be doing really well. They're having puppies at several locations, which is good. Um, we'll know soon how many they're having, but I suspect it's several. And they are getting prey pretty consistently. We haven't seen any wolves that have looked super malnourished. Um, wolves in general in the summertime lo always look really scrappy because people are used to seeing them in their thick winter coat. And when they see a summer wolf with its short fur, they're like, oh my God, that wolf is so thin. But really, they're just a lanky animal. Um, but yeah, I would say no present concerns about wolves on the coast. They seem to be doing really well. Um, and they're beautiful. The one thing I would say is that Sarcoptic mange is in the red fox population. 
in Katmai, we have seen foxes that are missing almost all the hair on their tail at some sites. So that is a potential threat to um, you know, the foxes and potentially also the wolves in the area. Uh, another thing is that wolves have been seen in Katmai with something called follicular dysplasia, which is a condition that influences the growth pattern of their hair. Um, and this, to my knowledge, is not something that actually troubles the wolf much. I don't think it's anything that's dangerous for them, but it is a concern for people who are interested in trapping wolves in Alaska because a pelt that has that sort of growth pattern of hair is not as desirable. So I know that there's some sort of human perspective concern about wolves with, with follicular dysplasia in the Katmai population getting out into areas where wolves are hunted and spreading that condition. Very interesting. And, you know, we had so many questions. There are a lot more I know that we didn't get to answer. It's possible Ellen might have some time afterwards to jump in the chat and um, answer them by, by message. So um, if we didn't get to your questions, hopefully we'll be able to do so after this. Uh, but thank you for joining us today, Ellen, and sharing some of your insight into the foraging ecology of Katmai's wolves. It is always interesting to learn about what new things we're learning here at Katmai. So thank you again, Ellen, for joining us. Thank you so much. It's been awesome. Nice. And thank you also to everyone behind the scenes at explore.org. And as they say at Explore, never stop learning.